Good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you are in the globe. It's a pleasure to welcome you once again uh, to our expert series, part of ES's A Way to Learn uh, initiative. Today we have the great pleasure of welcoming a colleague and friend, Ben Nelson. He's the founder and CEO of Minerva, probably one of the most exciting experiments in higher education of uh, the last decade, if not uh, more. We have uh, a, a group of people joining from all corners of the planet, from Taiwan to England, from Poland and Germany to Argentina, and of course the US, where Ben is located over in uh, California. Um, good morning to you, Ben. Thank you for joining us. We're very happy to be here. Fant so I thought we'd get started uh, a little bit with uh, you. Uh, and uh, what brought you to the position, the industry, uh, the profession that you're in today. Um, you know, I, I, when I last met you, you were at your alma mater, uh, Wharton, um, fresh off a uh, career in, in industry. Um, you know, not, none of these two uh, factors typically are uh, the starting points or the, the, the inputs for uh, a career in academia or in, in, in learning, uh, which is uh, the profession you find yourself in today. So how did this passion uh, start? Bring us back to the moment in which you said, I will create a new institution uh, in, uh, in, in the learning space. Well, there were actually uh, two moments that were quite a few years apart. The first one was when I was a first year student at university uh, and came to realize that the, the structure of universities, as many of us know, is uh, less than ideal, if we were to put it politely. Uh, but universities really are supposed to train individuals to participate in a dynamic world, uh, not to train them for a particular career. That's what vocational schools are for. Um, it's actually to enable them to uh, live a modern life where you will have uh, a dozen careers or so by the time you die, where you have different jobs, different uh, responsibilities, provide you broad-based abilities to move from one area to another, taking along core ideas or, or capacities like critical thinking and problem solving and uh, effective communication skills, etc. So the, the role of universities in that case is not much in dispute. Every university agrees that that's what they can do. But when I was a university student, it was very apparent to me that universities don't do this at all. And, uh, and that was something that is where I tried to spend my four years uh, at the University of Pennsylvania to fix. Um, and it didn't work because an Ivy League university has no real interest in reforming just because it's better educational outcomes. Uh, all of the prestige, all of the demand from universities comes from completely different things. I actually funny enough, has nothing to do with the educational output. So I gave up, and I went into the normal workings of the day, day world. It was the rise of the commercial internet, and I uh, spent uh, well over a decade in, in, in that world, and then realized that you could actually solve or reform fundamental problems in society, not just by going and telling existing institutions, hey, please, won't you change, but actually create a new institution, um, and then showing how uh, institutions can take a better path. Uh, and so that was really my ultimate aha moment eight years ago, when I realized that if I was truly wanting to change education, and by that point, being an industry, running a couple of companies, I saw the impact of people who didn't know how to really think systematically, uh, and that was not good. Uh -huh. and, and so and I realized that if I started my own institution and demonstrated to other universities that there is a better way to educate their students, that could be a catalyst for change. Yeah. So one irony, I guess, is that you couldn't quite do that, though, without faculty. Uh, and and yeah. I guess you understood that yourself. So tell us how the pitch came across. And then specifically, you mentioned earlier that Steve Koslin, your founding dean, has now retired. But specifically, at some point, you found a, an ear that was willing to listen or a partner that was willing to go on this venture. Yeah. How did that work out? 
Well, yeah, the, the, the interesting thing was that initially, for, really for the first year and a half of me working on, on Minerva, it was really just me. Uh, there, was, there was nobody that, there were a lot of people that I talked to, and most of them thought I was out of my mind. Um, <laughs> the, you know, it's, it's hard enough for somebody to say, oh, yes, I'm going to start a university, it sounds completely crazy for somebody to say, I'm going to start a university that will effectively fly above Stanford, above the Ivy League, above Oxford and Cambridge, and show them what it is meant to be the world's greatest university. So for, for most people, that sounded completely crazy. Um, and then by uh, about a year and a half after I started working on, on this project, um, I, I got to meet through a friend of a friend of mine, uh, Larry Summers, uh, who was obviously former president of Harvard, former treasury secretary of the United States, uh, perhaps the most famous living university president or ex-president. Uh, he, was, he was the former president of Harvard at the time. And we got to meet in a, uh, uh, under the premise of, hey, this is somebody who's doing something interesting in education. Larry had no real background of what it is that I was doing. I wasn't public about what I was doing. It was still just me working on it. And what should have been a half-hour meeting turned into a two-hour meeting. And basically, Larry was finishing uh, my sentences as I was explaining what a university should do and what I was planning to, to do with it. And Larry was really the first, uh, you know, academic, and what an academic, what a, a person of, of enormous stature and respect, who Im immediately got what we were trying to do in trying to show a, uh, an extraordinary method of education and bringing it to the most deserving students all around the world. Uh, and it was really Larry's backing uh, initially that enabled uh, uh, that enabled me to go out and raise the initial uh, uh, funding and eventually find our, our initial faculty, Stephen Coslin, who was our founding dean, who was a former uh, dean of social science at Harvard and uh, director of the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Science at Stanford, uh, Vicky Chandler, who's our current chief academic officer, who was uh, on the, is in the executive committee of the National Academy of Science, uh, one of the world's most respected uh, plant biologists and molecular biologists. And so we were able to gather this extraordinary group of, uh, of faculty that both understood how academia works, but were also aware that what academia does is fundamentally broken and therefore had to be rethought and reformed. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most interesting aspects about your experiment, or about, well, your no longer experiment, your uh, real, you know, an initiative, is its focus on impact. You know? Because in this day and age, when we think of innovation in education, it's also often about efficiency. Um, you know, mm -hmm. online is a substitute of. Um, whereas your focus is on impact, actually improving, you no know, leveraging technology right. if it's useful, uh, but actually improving the experience. Can you talk a little bit uh, about about that? Why is Minerva exceptional in terms of its pursuit of impact? Yeah. Uh, so fundamentally, when you look at technological innovation in any sector, the innovations that are short-lived and meaningless are those that say, how do I do what I currently do offline and do it incrementally better. Those, those innovations Correct. don't really change the world. They don't make any real impact and they're usually passed by. What they're passed by are technological innovations that look at the purpose, an idealized purpose of something and then think about how can technology be brought to bear to change the dynamic, actually enable an output, product, a service, what have you, that fundamentally cannot be done without technology. So an easy way of thinking about it is that if ride-sharing companies, Uber, Lyft, DD, um, if they were to think of technology as an incremental innovation, what they would do are apps that turned on the flashlight of your phone so that when you hail a cab, it'll see you better, right? 
that would be a complete waste of money. No one would invest in it. It wouldn't be, I mean, maybe somebody would invest in it. Wouldn't get a lot of return, right? What, what ride-sharing companies did instead is think about, well, the experience is completely broken. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You try to hail a cab on the street, you call a cab, you don't know if they're going to show up, if they're going to cancel, if you take 40 minutes or five minutes. So instead, let's change the user experience, let's change the entire output so that you can get something that you actually want, which is have some certainty between getting from point A to point B. In education, it's far more complicated than that. But the lack of technology in traditional education, which has been the case for a thousand or five thousand years, depending on how far back you want to go, has really limited educational offerings in doing two fundamental things. The first one is to make sure that students are engaged during their active their their class time uh, when, when they're supposed to be applying what it is that they've learned. And so instead. Most offline educational environments have disseminated or, or deteriorated to disseminating information, mm-hmm. right? And dissemination of information actually a pretty uh, bad use of live time, right? There's there are many far better uh, uh, vehicles to disseminate information. The book, uh, for example, or videos that you can watch, you can pause and rewind and things like that. Live explanation of information in a unidirectional way, even peppered with a couple of questions, is really highly ineffective. So, and the reason that was defaulted to that is because keeping students engaged, fully engaged in applying information is difficult without the assistance of technology, which was one of the things that we solved. The second problem, the more fundamental one, is a curriculum uh, problem which is that it used to be when we knew very little about the world, 18th century, 19th century, et cetera, their universities, especially in the United States, had a very rigid core curriculum. Mm -hmm. They would teach you these broad areas, Greek, Latin, dead white men, science, math, et cetera, philosophy. Um, But you didn't have any choice. There was a canon of information you were to go through that, maybe you had a little bit of choice in your fourth year, and then you get your degree. And then if you wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or what have you, you would get a graduate degree in in that field. And what happened over time is information exploded. Universities couldn't then curate the information that it is that you needed. It was just too much. And so they moved away from curating curricula to being free choice especially, again, in the United States, take whatever you want. Mm -hmm. In the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world, there was no general education. You know, you went and you studied physics, you studied history, you studied business, and that is all you studied. You skipped the whole enterprise of general education, which is problematic, because general education is the only way for you to get these broad capacities. If you learn how to be a critical thinker in physics, turns out studies show that you will be no better of a critical thinker in home, um, in home finance than if you weren't a good critical thinker in physics. There's, there's, you're basically the same as any average professional. And that is the problem of our transfer. So in order to solve that fundamental problem, you had to create a curriculum that traversed the unit of study, which is the course. It had to enable students to learn an idea, a learning objective, we refer to as habits of mind, or foundational concepts in one context, and then be able to transfer and apply them to a number of other contexts. Uh-huh. Right? And so that combination of, uh, of, of processes is extremely hard to pull off in a, an offline environment, uh, certainly in a data-free environment. Whereas in a data-rich environment, we can measure learning objectives for our students of, on over 100 different areas and see how they progress and master them across 30 different courses, up to 30 different professors. Right? That process enables, is, is a technology-enabled educational process that is vastly superior to what you can do without technology. And so that was the orientation of, of Minerva and what we were trying to do.
Yeah, a very simple example that you gave me back um, at Wharton uh, and that you shared with your audiences uh, since then, of course, is the is the lecture, right? I mean, sometimes, um, you know, you were referring to it earlier, the transfer of knowledge. It's not that you, you threw that out completely, you recognized, hey, that's a sort of necessary evil, if you will, but I'm going to actually solve that need in a new way with technology. And they're the active learning forum, no? Exactly. And, and so this ability to actually, um, you know, use technology where it is enhancing and where it is improving what uh, the other means, I think, is very unique uh, to Minerva. <laughs> Tell us about the recruitment of the students. What, um, I guess there was some, uh, you know, uh, nervousness, you know, when you went out to the market with this uh, value proposition. Uh, what was the reaction that you received? Uh, and, and where was the motivation coming from? I mean, deeply, you know, I, I, I don't know. You can imagine, your, I don't know, my son, right? Uh, he has a choice of different options. Is it me that is advising him, hey, go to Minerva? Is he himself that is saying, hey, I want something different. I will go to yeah. Minerva. Where, where did it come from? Right. So, so one of the interesting things is, is you, you know, you earlier you mentioned uh, that Minerva was an experiment. And it actually was not. Uh, and that's actually one of the great misconceptions that people have about Minerva. So let me uh, uh, put this in, into a, a different analogy. And I'll ask you, uh, do, you have, do you have children by any chance? I do. You do. So Still too young for Minerva, think, but uh, thinking yeah. about it. <laughs> so let, let's, let's imagine that you, you have a, a child, and heaven forbid, heaven forbid, uh, your child uh, is in an accident and hurts his knee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you, you need to bring your child to the hospital to get an operation on his knee. So you have two options in order uh, to, to operate on your child's knee. Uh, option number one is that you can bring your child to a healer that uh, uh, practices thousand-year-old uh, practices in knee surgeries. It means alcohol, uh, a, a blade that is uh, on a fire, a saw, uh, and some other tools, right? But it's been done for thousands of years. Um, the other one is to bring your child to the, uh, uh, the latest uh, cutting-edge hospital with brand new technology. Uh, the hospital is just open, by the way. It's brand new. It's never had a patient before. But it utilizes everything that is known about the latest surgical techniques, has the best tools, um, and doctors specifically trained at uh, operating on knees in, uh, in, in this modern context. What would you choose to fix your child's knee? <laughs> I don't know. Right? Uh, yeah. I guess the... the pretty, pretty easy question. I don't think anybody would opt for the saw. Right? Now, at the same time, and, and no, by the way, nobody's bothered by the fact this hospital opened just now. Brand new. Right? But now, there's, a, there's an ignorance, though. With respect so, to so, no. so think about now that it's not your knee that your child needs to have operated on, it's his brain. You're bringing him into brain surgery. Mm -hmm. That's what education is. It's brain surgery. And again, option number one is has a ninety percent six month failure rate. That is what universities have. When you are sitting in a typical university class. The, the overwhelming uh, number of credits that are issued by Ivy League universities, six months after the end of the semester course, students forget 90% of what they learned, right? Huge failure rate. It is actually worse than sawing your knee. It's a terrible outcome. Or you can go to an educational institution that is based on decades of research that actually demonstrates how the brain, that demonstrate how the brain works and how people learn and applies everything that is known, not in an experimental way at all, mm -hmm. actually just an application of what we know works to educate. Now, the initial reaction for some people is, oh, no, 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 we want to do things that are you know, uh, tried and true, and everybody knows how they're doing it. We're comfortable with the saw. But those people can actually be a little bit analytical about it, realize that there really is no real option. There's only one true option if you care about education. Mm -hmm. 
And so our initial group of students, the ones that came in initially, were very small. We had uh, a pilot class of 20-some uh, of students. And, uh, and that group came in purely based on that analytical exercise. Today, you know, now we're welcoming our fourth class, uh, they're, they're coming in on data. Uh, and the data uh, is, as one would expect when you compare uh, a medieval method versus a modern method, uh, uh, an order of magnitude better. So there's a third party assessment in the United States called the Collegiate Learning Assessment. Uh -huh. The Collegiate Learning Assessment uh, has been uh, uh, performed uh, uh, for hundreds of universities, hundreds of thousands of students over the years, and it measures progress in critical thinking, problem solving, scientific reasoning, and effective communication skills. These are all the things that universities claim they teach. And the way it's administered, which is very clever, is that it's provided at the beginning of the first year and the end of the fourth year. And then they, you see how a cohort of students at an institution has progressed. So you see what the contribution of the institution was to that progression, especially when you compare one institution to another. So we give our students the CLA. And at Minerva, what happens is that rather than waiting four years, we give our students the first year test at the beginning of the first year, but we give them the fourth year test at the end of the first year. So only eight months later. And the results are astonishing. The delta improvement we make with our students in eight months is the highest the CLA has ever seen any university accomplish over four years, ever. So what we do in one year, no university has ever been able to demonstrate that they can do in four. Wow. And our students at the end of the first year, the, uh, the year that they were, they were uh, assessed, had the highest composite score in the country compared to fourth year graduating students. And almost all of the institutions that the CLA has shown make improvements, large improvements in the past, not as large as ours, but large, actually started with relatively poor performing students, right? Then we go from the 25th to the 37th percentile. We had the largest gains ever, and we topped out. And so last year, when you look at those results, we had more than 23,000 applicants to Minerva. That's more than Georgetown, MIT, uh, Dartmouth, Ivy League University at 250 years old. And despite the fact that we accepted uh, just over 1%, 1.2% of those applicants, nearly two-thirds of those applicants wound up matriculating at Minerva as opposed to all of the other elite institutions that they were um, accepted by, uh, which not only makes us by far the most selective university in the United States, but also one of the highest yielding, where most Ivy League universities yield in kind of the mid to upper uh, 60s percentile. That's tremendous. So I would love to talk uh, for another hour with you. We only have a few minutes, but I wanted to ask a, few, a couple more questions, and, and hopefully our audience will, will stick with us. Um, so the first question, though, is what about the business, right? Because one of, your met, one of your goals was to actually make this affordable. There's a question from the audience along these lines of access to extraordinary education. That was actually, I remember you speaking about that, one of your goals, to make it as good as Harvard, but for a fraction of the cost, accessible. Is that business-wise doable at this point? Yes, absolutely. So if you look at the student body at the Minerva School, so access really comes on two different levels. Mm -hmm. So number one is what we do with our own university. And so at the Minerva Schools, uh, we charge $30,000 a year for tuition fees, room, and board. And half of that cost, we can't control because it's the cost of being alive. It's living and eating. Uh, that money doesn't go to us, it goes to a building, or it goes to a food uh, budget for students to, to buy food and, and to live for, for eight months. And so tuition and fees at Minerva is about $15,000, and that's compared to north of $50,000 for traditional American universities. So it's a huge difference. But even more importantly, more than 80% of our students can't afford it. Right? Now the traditional elite 
need blind institution in the United States, need blind is, means that they don't ask you specifically how much your parents make in making the decision of whether or not you should come. Um, 50% of students can afford to pay $70,000 a year. If we were to charge $70,000 a year, 5% of our students would be able to afford it, right? And so the way that we do access at Minerva isn't just that we're lowering the overall cost, is that we actually change the process of admissions. Now, because our students at Minerva require so much scholarship support, we don't have the luxury of scaling the institution very large yet, unless we raise a lot more philanthropic funds, we can't really increase the size of, of the Minerva schools. However, access also has a second component. And the second component is really the point, that, or the point of Minerva existing overall. It isn't just to start the world's greatest university and you know, laugh at others that are using medieval methods. Uh, it's actually quite the opposite. It's to start this institution that everybody can look up to, but then emulate, copy, uh -huh. right? And so the first aspect of what, what we did was uh, almost a year ago, we published a book, Building the Intentional University, which outlines how anybody can build their own Minerva. Uh, and, and all of the principles behind what we teach, how we teach it, how we operate in a much more efficient way than a traditional institution. The second thing, which where our first partnership is launching uh, this September with the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology is to actually take the Minerva curricular structure, curriculum, pedagogical methodology and technology and embed it within existing universities and therefore provide the kind of education that we provide to our students within the Minerva schools to university students all over the world. And HKUST, which we announced just a couple of months ago, is our launch partner. And there will be, we expect, many other institutions over the coming years that will adopt the Minerva system and effectively bring their education into the 21st century. Extraordinary. And, and there's a question from the audience. Um, so what about the rest of us uh, that are not uh, sort of uh, 18? Um, it, you know, and I'm in the exec ed business. We talked about this at some point uh, in the past. Is this a model that is uh, viable beyond university education? Is there opportunity in the executive development space? Yes. So, uh, so first and foremost, Minerva also uh, very quietly for the last couple of years has offered uh, a master's program. Um, now, no one has ever heard of it because. Uh, we, we were not, you know, advertising, we were talking about it. Uh, the first time we did it, it was a one-year full-time program. The second time we did it, uh, we're doing it as a part-time 21-month program. And that's probably what we're going to move, that is what we're going to move forward with. So in September of 2019, we're actually uh, uh, opening up the doors to our, uh, to our uh, master's program. It's a master's in decision analysis. Okay. And it's actually a master's that takes the various systematic uh, uh, thinking, the systematic ways of thinking that we provide to our students as tools, brings it up to the master's level and provides it to exec uh, and, uh, and the application cycle for that will begin in a couple of months. Uh, and so we are going to be uh, taking applications and it's, uh, also a, a, a pretty remarkable value. It's uh, just under $40,000 for the whole degree. Uh, it, it will last from September of uh, 2019 until May of 2021. So that's the next cycle. And, uh, and that master's program will provide all of the frameworks for decision analysis that an executive needs to make decisions of consequence, big systematic decisions. So it's effectively the equivalent of uh, an executive degree, executive master's degree, but focused on uh, uh, decision analysis. Now, there are component parts of that offering that can be brought to the executive education market that may not be as robust as a full master's degree, but there's component sure. parts. Sure. However, what you won't really see from Minerva 
is the week-long seminar, which is very popular in the executive education world. Um, it, there, you know, week-long seminars can be good for a lot of different things, but to really fundamentally change how the brain processes information, a week is not enough. Uh, and so you need space to live practice, you need, uh, you need time to, uh, to really digest and apply and transfer. That's what Minerva is really so special at. Uh, the ability to provide long form, deep education, brain surgery in other words. Mm. And that's, uh, and you'll see more and more offerings like that, primarily from Minerva's partners. Uh, that are going to be using the Minerva system to bring executive education offerings and other offerings to market. Mm. Last uh, uh, clip from you, uh, sound clip bite, if you will, as we're uh, wrapping up. One thing that has truly surprised you and one thing that you're still gnawing at you is kind of on your bucket list. Um, very short. Uh, sorry. You one, no, the one thing that has truly surprised you and one thing that you're just still frustrated you haven't got right. Yeah, so the truly surprising uh, was that when, when, when I started Minerva, my assumption was that it would be a decade after we graduated our first students before other universities and educational institutions paid attention. And what was stunning to me was that universities started approaching us even before we had our first students. Uh, and, and you know we didn't know what to do with them for the first few years, but the reason that we were able to pick HKUST as our launch partner is because we had a couple of hundred different institutions that approached us over the years and said, hey, we would love to work together. And so, uh, so HKUST was just an ideal partner for us. And we had the luxury of kind of picking them. And ever since we made that announcement, the demand to partner and work with, with Minerva and use the system has, has really been overwhelming. And so we're, we, we've been very fortunate in the uh, being in the position of needing to, to choose who we will work with and, and on what types of, uh, of projects. So that was, has been a very good positive surprise. Uh, probably my, my greatest frustration uh, is in the world of philanthropy. Um, it, the, as I mentioned, the overwhelming majority of our students require financial support to attend Minerva. And we, as far as I know, are the only truly highly selective, non-discriminatory undergraduate program in the world. Uh, so basically, if you are uh, a student applying from Spain or a student applying from Nebraska or a student applying from Brazil or China, your likelihood of getting in is exactly the same, right? You're using the exact same criteria. There's no concept of spots. If you're qualified, you'll get a spot in Minerva. And that kind of egalitarian approach both means that we have a very different socioeconomic base of our students, but also means that, you know, our, our students really can come from anywhere in the world. And when we go to a philanthropist, most, many philanthropists can say, hey, these students need support. By the way, it's a great deal. It's a fraction of the support that they would need to go to other universities. So your dollar can support far more students here than, than elsewhere. Many philanthropists will come to us and say, well, how many students do you have from my hometown? How many students do you have from you know, my country or from this country I have a particular interest in? And no country represents even 10% of the student body. And so, and we have representatives from 61 different countries. And so when in a world that is increasingly more global, um, we are, we, we don't find it as easy to find truly globally minded uh, philanthropists who think about humanity as a whole, as opposed to small segments of it. And that, uh, and that is uh, a frustration. Uh, in the sense that I believe the world needs far more globally oriented philanthropists. Well, Ben, thank you very much. It's been a, personally a pleasure reconnecting with you. It's fascinating to follow your uh, example. And for those that don't know it in detail, I advise you strongly to uh, familiarize yourself with uh, Minerva by its website, by the many videos that are out there on YouTube. And uh, yeah, once again, thank you very much for your time. And thank you all for joining this uh, today. 
for our uh, session. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care.